Hello, welcome to Soma Stories, a podcast vessel for inquiry around the body, hosted by me, Shami. Each episode gathers and weaves various perspectives around a related issue. Our hope is that this podcast will be a space for the practice of listening, an opening of headspace, and a regrounding of self. This second episode is on the natural environment and the body's position within this vast expanse. I will be speaking to musician and illustrator Anise and Ground Up Initiative volunteer and co-founder of Untamed Paths, Neo Xiaoyun. But let's begin with some snippets from last episode's guest, Chloe Trotrani, whose bodywork is deeply connected to the earth. My name is Chloe Calderon Trotrani. I work mainly as a embodiment facilitator, a somatic practitioner, as well as a movement artist. I have ancestry um, in from the Philippines and in India and here in Singapore. And yes, I'm based here in Singapore for now. Chloe shares about how growing up in the Philippines guided her to this sense of connection and how a change of environment affects our bodies. Philippines is one of the top five countries that gets the brunt of climate change. So you just really go with the flow. Like if it floods, it you know, you're kind of, you have to deal with pretty difficult situations. And I grew up in that kind of context. And so... Yeah, it's a lot more mysterious and it just kind of throws you in a storm and you just have to be in the center and ground yourself. Whereas in Singapore, everything's functioning, everything works well, you know, everyone's like on time, you can track the bus. So here I'm like, I really, I mean, I will never ever take sidewalks for granted. (laughs) I know that sounds funny, but I'm just really enjoying it because I grew up in such a city where things were really chaotic. I think a deeper connection to our bodies, like really spending time with it, listening to it, um, will will aid in our connection to each other and it will aid in our connection to our environment around us. Our, our, a deeper connection with our internal world will help a deeper connection to the external world. My memories of being in nature, like really wild landscapes, um, when we were in lockdown, I, it, I, I was really paining to, to not have access to that. And so I think that's actually what led to a deeper practice of body as earth. And that's what led to a deeper practice of dancing landscapes. Um, and a large part of my experience dancing growing up was just this feeling of liberation. I just felt so free in my body. And for someone who is so shy and quiet to feel this like wildness and liberation it's just I'll never forget it and I'll always do it and I can't just have this for me this needs like this needs to be shared and just recently I moved um like closer towards the east coast and so I'm already noticing how different my body is like just being able to spend more time cycling or running or you know it really it really changes your your body and I think this kind of you can say like embodied wisdom is something that we do need to nurture and we tend to forget because we're so demanded of you know through in in our headspace right in 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 a desk job it's society is structured in a way where you just forget (laughs) yeah actually even amidst a concrete jungle there there is kind of pockets of I mean that too is nature right we have to I think it's also doesn't do justice to think about nature as just the green spaces and the parks but actually the urban scapes and even the concrete 
right? The concrete is also sourced from minerals under the ground. Or even our phones, like whatever our phones are made of is from somewhere under there, under the ground. <laughs> so it's, I think this is also part of our natural environment. And so to be able, I guess, to make that bridge and to find some kind of balance, I mean, it's all easier said than done. I mean, even if we just think about like what the body is made of, right? Like our bones and the durability of our bones is made of made up of like the substrata of the earth it's like the same material um and so I even just thinking about that I just feel like we're so much a part of the earth it's a lot of the times we feel like you know okay we're just living our life and you know there's a park there and <laughs> um Oh, okay, this is the weather today. But actually, everything is interconnected and it affects us in all these ways that we, we can't even see necessarily. Our bodies as substrata of the earth. We'll be returning to this concept of interconnectedness throughout this episode. One of my favourite things about recording this is how I feel closer to the world after having recorded it. Next, I speak to Xiao Yun, who leads us into what working in wildlife and farming is like. So hi everyone, I'm Xiao Yun and um, by day I'm a policy officer with the government, with the civil service. And when the office hat comes off, I do like two, two things mainly. So one, I volunteer with GUI, which is a non-profit society in the heartlands of Ishun Katit and we do a lot of regenerative natural farming there. Uh, we expose people to concepts of like connecting with the earth, with themselves and with each other. And then on the side, I, I do some like wildlife and biodiversity education with the untamed paths. I facilitate some immersive experiential walks in nature, so both in terrestrial and in intertidal environments. And this is actually to strive to ignite some curiosity and awareness of our local fauna. I ask her about the bodily adjustments city dwellers often have to make. When I expose myself to, to go out, I think uh, first thing is like attunement. So uh, you, I, I had to train my eyes to, to see in the dark and to see different distances. So there's the close to the path distance and there's the further into the trees and different elevations. So um, essentially like I had to... Um, expose myself to different depths. Uh, I remember when I was still learning how to spot things. Uh, I, I I took so long that uh, my my hiking partners would be out of sight. So essentially, the whole environment around me is all dark except for my torchlight because I was so slow. I didn't want to miss anything. Yeah. So um, attunement lah. Yeah, was what I had to learn. Secondly, was like starting to hear things. So like. Um, had to learn things like frog calls, bird song, um, yeah, because, uh, and, then, and then also picking them out from cricket calls, which is the cricket call is the permanent sound that you often hear, then uh, on top of that you must figure out the different layers, uh, what other animals are around. Um, and then if we really want to push ourselves, right, is that if we hear uh, an owl call, is uh, if it's close enough to figure out where the owl is. So that, that one is very tough because uh, having to place where the owl is in the forest is more difficult than, than you imagine because there are different layers of elevation and then there's different like depth. I remember last time it was, I even had to distinguish like, oh, this is a cricket sound and not a frog. It's just different species of crickets, you know, they sometimes make different calls. Then when I moved to the intertidal environment, it's uh while well, the waters in Singapore are murky, right? So like you need to like see like, oh okay, everything is brown. Okay, even the intertidal creatures are brown, right? Because they want to camouflage. So um what kind of markings do animals make when they go into the sand? Yeah, this kind of marking is a sea cucumber and this kind is a snail. So um kind of picking up their marks lah, and uh, that's yeah, and another kind of attunement. So um, okay, I think what I want to say is that I think different 
environments require different specific levels of attunement, yeah, and um, each uh, needs their own um, um, specific skills. So um, it's very interesting how I've tried to stretch my senses, lah. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, one of like a very uh, memorable sound is that of a cinnamon bush frog. So this cinnamon bush frog is orange in color with white specks on it and it's a very small frog like just this big yeah like 4 cm yeah so uh but they make very loud calls uh, yeah so i think that call i i heard it for months and months um but we it was often quite far in so i was like oh when am i gonna see the cinnamon bush frog so then dennis was like my, my partner was like oh don't worry one day we'll find it just by the side of the path and it'd be so loud that you know it's by the side of the path. So one day that really happened. Yeah, but it was just like all those months of training my ear to hear out for that sound because I wanted to find this frog. Maybe like remember the sound. Yeah. And I mean, thereafter I've only seen three la, three seven bush frogs in two years. So yeah, it's one of those things that you often hear, but you you hear it, but you don't you don't see it. But you just have to be comforted that it's there, it's out there. Comforted by the presence of it. For example, I think nature, like, it demands that you pay attention and you kind of, like, almost every moment something new can happen and if you just so happen to be distracted looking at your phone or taking out your phone, uh, you might just miss a movement or you just might miss an eye shine of a memo. So, yeah. <laughs> because memos, they give off eye shine la, to help them see at night. Eye shine is like, if you look into the distance and you shine a torch, you can actually see like glowing circles in the distance. So that could be like a mouse deer, um, a samba deer, kalugos, any like any sort of mammal can give that off. Wild boar, yeah. Next, we talk about Ground Up Initiative, a volunteer-driven non-profit community and what it means to give back to the land. GI, I must put it as the as the foremost like influence right because I think GI like when I first started um, it uh, it's a every it's an activity every Saturday morning so imagine like five days of work and then you know by the time it's like Thursday I'm looking forward to Saturday already because it's just um, I see it as a way to start the weekend right because it's like a detox like almost by doing the direct opposite of work that you can like regain your life <laughs> so you, you go down you like talk to people and then you like um, exert yourself physically and you kind of give back to something that um, yeah you give back to, to the land and you give back to like the community so that's something that is not so much the case for my work right because um, I mean the impacts for my work is, is also for the for, for Singapore but it's more indirect but here it's like so direct and you exert yourself physically so there's that cause and effect that you can see yeah so you know I always find that after Saturday morning I'm so tired and I mean that was refreshing that I um, yeah actually it was refreshing that it was um, that we were physically exerting myself and also that um, the rep the repetition of it was actually very therapeutic for me. Knowing that, like, for any piece of plot, right, like, we were doing different things to it every week. So, like, one week could be, like, weeding, then next week we could be, like, um, putting in compost, and following week could be, like, harvesting. So, like, seeing that plot, like, grow, also different kind of crops, because we do crop rotation, was um, very meaningful for me. Yeah. For GI, I think, like, the movement, like, away from like being entirely cerebral to like being more physical is something that I really appreciate yeah and along with that like when you're working with someone and you're both like physically like exhausting yourself like it's quite a lot of like camaraderie yeah when you're like weeding the backyard together under the sun or like yeah when you're like um, able to connect with someone you met for the first time because you went through the same experience yeah GI is actually one of the things we cultivate is solitude. So, you know, beyond just being with uh, other volunteers, sometimes you just have to work on a space yourself. Sometimes you're given tasks. And so GI is as much about all the other things I mentioned, like education, sustainable living, physical labor. But it's also about like solitude. And, you know, in, 
in the words of like this quote that we often tell our volunteers is that um, you know all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone so our aversion to being alone is often an aversion to boredom so we need to you know really fight this because if we can't uh, just be and we always want to do something I think that would generate a lot of problems nah. yeah so yeah I think being in GI allows you to really pare back uh, on the basics yeah if you can try to do that for three hours, I think that can be often for many people like a starting point to think about how they can readjust their lives. Our last guest is illustrator and musician Anise. We delve into the philosophical underpinnings of nature that serve as a balm for our lives. My name is Sue, but I often go by Monica Anise. Uh, in both my visual and sonic practice. So, yes, my practice lives in between the sonic and visual space, and sometimes I oscillate between doing oil paintings to doing things like composition for others or also composing my own music. Um, yeah, so generally, so far in this space, but I've also done like installations and stuff. Yeah, so, yes, my headspace would mostly be in trying to understand my own relationship with nature and to delve deeper into that relationship for now. Yeah, nature has really come to the forefront very recently, but I think to me, nature has always been quite deeply rooted in a lot of the things that I do since young, especially. But it was always this like vast, big, beautiful other like something that was away from me, not something that was integrated or with me, but still dear to me. So, but as I began to learn a bit more about nature from like research or like talking to different artists or like just going down the scientific rabbit hole of like finding out more about like fungi and like all these multicellular organisms, I started to realize more and more that I was nature as well. Nature and me are one and merged in some way. So that's where I began to, that's when I began to want to explore a lot more of this in my art practice. When I was thinking about non-breaking space, which is currently in SIFA, uh, Singapore International Festival of the Arts that is curated by Syndicate, it's under the Plus Eight program. So this project called Non-Breaking Space was meant to be kind of like a roadmap for me to explore my own connection with nature and to find out in some way why I'm so compelled to finding myself in the face of nature, I suppose. So non-breaking space was conceived in kind of like five different concepts um, and each of these are linked to an individual track as well as a painting and that was woven in with an experience that was created by Brendan Tay. This interactive digital experience where people can walk into this universe in the digital space. So the five concepts, they're all related to um, nature and my connection with it. One of it is called animism. And to me, animism is kind of like thinking about the life latent in all things, like here, an art wave studios in case you guys didn't know <laughs> but um things like the speakers or like a table or wood or chairs like each of these things have their own um spirit and life to me as well and i think yeah animism was about me trying to find out my place amongst all these things as well like these things are this for me i'm this for these things as well a shaman which i mean and a sue would be suing away, like, you know? So the things that we do and the things that we are creating, essentially, that is why we exist. It's like an alternative way to come to terms with my place within this earth, I guess. So that's animism for me. And I suppose it's also about finding nature within myself, animism, because there's this gulf between what we feel is ourselves and what nature is. This like, nature is like Bukitima Hill, you know, but nature is not 
in this space. Nature is not me. Nature is not this place. But I mean, to be fair, all of this is a composite from Earth as well. And we, our bodies, there's so much of it that's like filled with, I mean, it sounds a little bit strange, but like filled with microbes, filled with like fungi, filled with bacteria. Mm, they're all living within us. So we are also a kind of nature. Um, and what does that say? What are the agencies of these um, little microorganisms within us? That's kind of like the interesting point that I wanted to dig a little deeper into with the CP, I guess. Yeah, so that's kind of like, I guess it, it's so integrated with my album that's difficult to reply succinctly how nature has influenced it. But it's in pretty much all, like, its footprint is everywhere, I suppose. <laughs> Even though it began in nature, it also made me realize what what was nature because it's so overwhelming. I think in Tim Hortons, it's like a hyper object almost. Like it's, it's this big entity that just you cannot wrap your head around. My partner told me this, begin anywhere. So that's what I tried to do with the album. So we started with queerness. So <laughs> I'm a queer person. And throughout my life, like there's not been a lot of... Um, Rejection, I suppose. And that rejection often came with this notion that I was unnatural. Like, the way that I loved was unnatural. And so that gave this, like, it pushed me away and placed this distance between me and what was the natural world. Like, I was something that was, like, alien to my parents or, like, to, to the world around me. Um, and it was only recently that I started to learn a little bit more about the intricacies and the beauty of nature and that how diverse it was in all different ways of reproduction or like the different ways that animals interacted with each other. Like I, I was doing a composition for this artist called Mahit Zwans and she's from the Netherlands. And uh, I was doing a composition based on lichen. And the more I researched the lichen, the more fascinating it was to me, especially because... I realized they had so many different methods of reproduction and their relationship. Basically, lichen is like made up of both algae and fungi, right? But also like sometimes there are third parties like cyanobacteria or yeast and stuff like that. But they live together in such an entwined and meshed way. It was really fascinating to me how like you would find them growing apart from each other but finding each other again to create this new colony and then breaking apart and all these things but like the ways in which they lived was so different from what was the prevailing narrative of like heteronormity het heteronormativity <laughs> and um the different types of ways that they interacted with so i was learning about all these things and then thinking about my own relationship with nature as well because if you're being told constantly that you're natural because you're not A or B, then, yeah. I was just trying to find that space that I was meant to live in, in some way. Like, I do belong. Stop telling me that I don't, you know. So, yeah, it's not just lichen as well. Like, in the term, I think it was you who um, opened my eyes to it a bit earlier as well a term called queer ecology and I start looking even more into it. Like there are things like dragonflies mate with both sexes or like different butterflies who have both sexes sometimes or like, you know, fish or shrimp or all sorts of animals that were like so, yeah, they were just not binary in the way that we understood. Um, and I think that was really the impetus for me to delve deeper into what nature was so that I could feel that connection. And I guess find that belonging where I was meant to be, you know. <laughs> I guess that's what all I'm making is trying to dig a place for yourself. <laughs> I asked Anise about the ill body, something she's had to face from a young age. When you're sick, you're constantly in hospitals, you're in like very clinical environments, you're like in surgery all the time. Or like, I don't know, having tubes stuck down your throat or like having things dug out of you. Or like people telling you things like, you know, the tumour that is growing and that kind of stuff. Like, I mean, they're all benign, so like, but it just felt like my body was against me in some ways. Like it would just be me asking my body like, so what now? <laughs> what do you want from me? Or like, what more do I have to do? Because 
it didn't feel like I was meant to be here. Like I was constantly being challenged by the vessel that I was given, you know, to just be like, you sure you want to yeah, you sure you want to be here again? So it was a very strange way of growing up, I suppose. Um, like at 13, I had to go through like removal of benign tumors from my mouth, <laughs> which was an odd sensation because like it doesn't usually happen to 13 year olds, I guess. And then like at 17, at 20, at, like a lot of times. And also like I was living with scoliosis. So then it was almost like there's this bastion of perfection. You're meant to be straight. You're meant to be like literally straight as well. But <laughs> I kept veering away from that somehow, uh, whether or not I wanted to. So I suppose trying to find what was natural and what was perfect and this order of nature, you know, all this kind of things, I guess is a very natural progression. <laughs> so punny, oh my god. So it was a very natural trajectory, I suppose, to try to come to terms with that deviation from what was meant to be right in the eyes of society. Yeah. So recently I was kind of delving into the little world of like mycorrhizal networks. Like so these beautiful giant networks and webs of like fungi and the trees like growing from their roots and stuff like that. It's like a way for the trees to communicate with each other. So like we always think about fungi as like a agent of decomposition and like it's scary and it's strange and like I mean it looks alien pretty much if you like look under a microscope, right? But I think the thing that was confusing yet compelling to me was like that these fungi also look so beautiful to me, right? Like why were they such elusive things that people always will be like, ugh, you know, that gives me the creeps or like something. Like, why that reaction, you know? So I was trying to like figure that out because that felt like the same reaction that other people would have when they saw that their own insides. And I mean, bring, bring it back to the idea of like me constantly being in like clinical environments and stuff like that. But I would be looking at my insides so often, you know, there'd be so many ultrasounds, scans, scopes, like I was constantly looking up my, anyway. So <laughs> like, I would even be seeing like things like tumors in little boxes. Oh, that came from me or my body. I don't know what it is. But that same kind of like ugh, sensation. What is this like? uncanny, you know, uncanny valley that we're going down towards when we're looking at things decomposing. Why is it so scary to us? But very fascinating to me. So then I really wanted to go down that path to to see decomposition in a different light. So I think Citizen in this EP kind of has that exploration to try to see death and mo like mortality in a different light. It's about me having a dream about dying beside my partner and watching as she decomposed with me. Because that felt also like a merger of sorts, like the two of us just melding together with nature and becoming finally, you know, at peace, at rest. So the idea of trying to switch decomposition into something that's less daunting and less off-putting, I suppose, because death is beautiful. It's, we looked at the apocalypse always with this strange lens, like it is the death of the world and the world is something that needs saving and then all these things. But it's quite an odd thing because the more I looked into it, the more I felt like we are the apocalypse, not the things that are happening to us. Because always when we talk about the apocalypse, we are saying like, oh, the human race will be under danger, what, 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 all these kind of things. But the fact is we are the danger, right? So for the first track called The Source, um, I was exploring the idea that probably the apocalypse began when humans wielded fire. When we first understood fire, that's when the apocalypse began. Because the moment we had this um, tool of agency, right, we began to like burn things in different ways and like, I mean, chemical fires, pyrolytics, like all sorts of things started coming into play. The Industrial Revolution, technological advancements, all these kind of things. Like, we are the apocalypse, essentially. But also, I realized that um, apocalypse in, I think, Greek means revelation. So realizing that we are the apocalypse, what can we do with this information? Like, it is not just... Because if you think about it, if we do die, 
right? If the human race suddenly disappears, it also guarantees avoidance within this world. There will be regeneration. So the apocalypse can mean nihilism and like destruction and whatever, but it also means something beautiful, regeneration, like this creation of a new thing. We don't need to keep, you know, there's so many images of like the apocalypse being like this big burning world and stuff like that. But we fail to see the generative aspects and the revelatory aspects of the apocalypse as well. So, I mean, I think it's also a little bit like, it's a bit strange to put it in that perspective because we think, we center ourselves in a lot of this conversation. Uh, we always think about humans first, right? I think if we begin to think about like non-human entities as characters and players in this game with agency as well, then we realize that, oh, there's a different paradigm to looking at this as well. In the track animism especially, I keep going back to my project because like that's the way that I tried to figure all this out, right? There was one point that I felt, oh my god, this is what makes sense, which is that these lyrics came to me in some way, which is, I'm this for you, and you are this for me. And in some ways, an existential cry, right, also. Like, I'm here because I'm doing this. You are here because you are doing that. I'm here because I'm me. You are here because you are you. But I'm also this for you, and you are this for me. Like, that connection with this world. And I guess I hope that provides some level of solace. I'm not sure why that provided solace for me, but... That provides solace for other people too. <laughs> it's a very convoluted way of being like we are in this together. So for a body that has been traumatized, I'm really I'm saying this in a very like factual manner because also it's very difficult to think about myself in that light. But like a body that has been traumatized, a body that has gone through oppression, or a body that has gone through like all sorts of things, right? You fail to see, I guess, the path forward even though you are moving. Do you know what I mean? Like with PTSD or with like traumatic experiences, wherever you go, there's always a reminder somewhere that you are disconnected or you suddenly dissociate, that kind of thing. Like it's difficult to say that you move forward or you know where to go or you're reconciled. You're just like, okay, I'm just going to take one step. <laughs> this feels... 0.0001% better, you know? I think recently, I think I was reading the interview uh, by Grimes and a sci-fi author. I must find out the name. But she mentioned this term called protopia, which I thought was very interesting. Protopia being the idea that the destination is in some way a bit more formless as opposed to, say, like, utopia, dystopia. Because I think utopia and dystopia, they're, like, essentially mirrors of each other, right? So protopia is the idea that destination is less definite in some way. The idea that we're going to leave tomorrow just a tiny bit better than today. Which is in line with what I just said, of just like taking just a tiny step forward, of figuring out that 0.0001% betterness, I guess. So I think that's the kind of thing that I want to be able to follow in some way, because I think it's essential for us to think about adapting to this constantly changing world. Like, things are being thrown at us from everywhere, right? Wars, pandemics, whatever, climate grief, all sorts of things, like, big changes. And so if we are just barreling towards one direction, it's bound to be wrong in some way, right? So I suppose Protopia is in, in some level, like, a slow, like a snail pace movement towards, like a meandering, not-so-direction-driven way to get to somewhere better. I feel like that's probably the way to go. I'm not super sure as well, because I can't claim to have any finite understanding of where we should be either. Yeah, so maybe that. <laughs> Just 0 0.0001% better. Micro movements. I like that. Soma Stories is produced by Artway Studio in collaboration with Tell Your Children, 
If you enjoyed listening, continue to support us by subscribing and leaving a positive review on your listening platform of choice. The music you heard was from Anissa's EP, Non-Breaking Space. As always, we've included the relevant links and they can be found on artwave.studio slash Soma Stories. In the next episode, we explore labour and the body, the financial ties that bind, the physical toll on us, and the ways we labour through it all. I will be speaking with artists Michael Lee, Sonia Quack, and Pat Toh. Thank you for listening and see you again.